Welcome to episode 24 of Sharing Life Lessons. Together, we are creating a library of stories. This is season 3. I am your host, Hamida, and I want to bring you stories. Because stories inspire, stories teach, and stories heal. Listeners, I want to take you back to episode 13. My guest in episode 13 was Kay Skora, and her life lesson was listen to everyone's voice, give everyone a chance. In that episode, she was talking to us about how her entire life has been full of synchronicity, and she gave us one example about how she met her business partner, Paul Loper, where it was so synchronous that she thought that the universe had planned that meeting. Now, while she was telling us that, I already had thought about bringing Paul on as a guest and so I told her how synchronous it is for me that she even mentioned Paul's name because he was on my mind to bring on as a guest. And so 11 episodes later, everyone, let's welcome Paul Loper. Since Paul is going to talk about the dichotomies of life, I thought I would start this episode by giving an example of one such dichotomy and so I asked folks around. I actually got a really good response from my daughter Karina. I asked her if she ever felt a dichotomy or continues to feel dichotomy in her being and she said yes when she was in high school she took the toughest course that the high school had to offer which was advanced placement physics C, but she was a girl. She said there were 10 other students and they were all boys. She took advanced placement physics C, but she was a girl. That's a dichotomy. Those are the dichotomies our children are growing up with. Question to you is, do you feel that any part of your life consists of dichotomy or any circumstance around makes your being feel both but and if you do then I want you to bring that in the forefront of your mind while you listen to Paul's stories about the dichotomies in Paul's life and how his entire life has been filled with nothing but both slash but. Welcome to Sharing Life Lessons. I have been wanting to have you on this show for such a long time and here you are so thank you for being a guest on sharing life lessons well thanks for inviting me you are welcome paul i want you to start off by telling us a little bit about about yourself paul well i am a modern elder so i chronologically i'm in my early 60s i started doing art and visual art and uh, writing comics when I was like eight. And then I started doing theater when I was 13. And then I went to a conservatory for dance when I was 17. And I was very involved in dance and performance art in Seattle until 1981 when I left and I had the first chapter of a professional career as a dancer. I was working in Reno and Acapulco and Las Vegas dancing in these big shows that were very, very dated and very, very sexist. And after a while I was like, what am I doing? Is this really what I wanna do? Cause I had done a lot of modern dance and really interesting cultural inquiry in the, the movement work that I had been part of in Seattle. So I left the Vegas scene. I was in New York for four and a half years during which time I became aware that I was HIV positive. And this was the eighties and people were not living with HIV, they were dying from HIV. So I made a choice to go to Europe, figuring I didn't have an infinite number of years left. And I thought, I wanna give Europe a shot. So I had uh, the last chapter of my dance career in Paris. And then I came back to the States in 1995 and I was very sick. I had an AIDS diagnosis. For the next year or so, I was basically just a guy with a diagnosis and I had lost my identity, my performance career, my sense of my body as this 
thing that danced and traveled and lived in fun places like Paris. So I thought, well, if I'm not dead yet, I got to do something else. I can't just be a disease. I'm, I'm still me somewhere in there. So I wound up enrolling in a bachelor's completion program because the years back in Seattle that I had done in the conservatory had not earned me a BA yet. Mm -hmm. And the drugs that they were exploring at that time for living with HIV was the crucial turning point in what now we look at as this latest very successful chapter where people can live a long time with their HIV because the drugs help suppress the virus. In the late 90s, when I was in this chapter, that was just figuring itself out. So it wasn't a given yet that I would live a very long, but I was continuing to live. I wasn't dying. So I, mm -hmm. I went from the BA program into the doctoral program, and the program was called Learning and Change in Human Systems. So it kind of covered the waterfront. It enabled those of us in the program to zero in or think about connections within human systems in ways that really made sense to us. Uh -huh. And uh, that's when I moved to San Francisco. I graduated, I got my doctorate. I met Kay Scora, the amazing Kay Scora, who you've had on the podcast and has did have done work with her off and on since then. I did a program to train to become something called the T group facilitator at Stanford University for a course called Interpersonal Dynamics. Okay. And that, that has wound up being a really big piece of my life now that I have 25 years of life after my AIDS diagnosis, which I never knew was ahead of me. But now here I am in 2020, it's been 25 years since my AIDS diagnosis. And then I went back to the theater. After all these years, I, my system felt strong enough. I said, I'm gonna go back and do some auditions and be in some plays and be in some musicals. And so from 2010 to 2019, I did a lot of shows. I was performing again. I had a whole like second chapter of being this guy on stage, which who would have suspected that was in the, in the offing? That is amazing. You have been a dancer, a facilitator, a teacher, an HIV patient li living with HIV for so many years, and now a reborn theater performer. So you do have a lot of credentials there, Paul. And we've decided that with you, we'd actually do the reverse of what I've been doing always in all of my podcasts where guests tell their stories and then we talk about the life lesson. But I know you want to talk about your life lesson first. So tell us from everything that you have experienced in your life, what is that life lesson that you want to share with the listeners? What has risen to the surface and crystallized in my reflections, Hamida, knowing that I was going to have this conversation with you, is this notion of both and. So what, I, what started coming to me as I was thinking about my life, well, what do I want to talk about? I remember when I was very young, and I was a male, what they call a cisgendered male. I you know, was a male in a, in a male at birth body, but I was really identifying with all the females in the TV shows I watched. And for my birthday or for Christmas, I asked my parents for a dress or a Barbie doll. So I was this, what they call gender non-conforming as mm -hmm. a little boy. So it's not like I consider myself trans. I consider myself a male but I was very gender non-conforming during all of those years and then well into my teens. So there was this dissonance between the sense of being a boy and the sense of being a girl or the, how the world rewarded me for being this kind of boy, but they kind of like raised their eyebrows. And as I got into my teens, they did a lot more than raise their eyebrows. I was quite bullied. So this notion of being yes, but not that, but this, but not quite fully that. I got very involved in drawing, as I mentioned, and I was making my own comic strips. So I was writing the stories as well as drawing the images. I was retreating from the world. The world was, I think, was a little unsafe for me, being okay. as gender nonconforming as I was. The older I got, as I turned into a, a young teen and puberty set in, there was a lot of backlash from other boys that I was in their, you know, in society's estimation, and they sort of played the role of policing. I was the wrong kind of boy. So I think what I was doing, Hamida, was I was making a world 
that was safe for me, where I could not only feel safe through these characters, but I had all this power because they were superheroes. They could fly, mm -hmm. they could walk through walls, they could read people's minds. Then I got involved in theater and it was like, oh my God, this is like my comics, only with real people. Like the theater was magical. Maybe they couldn't fly and walk through walls, but they could do theatrical magic, which was a lot more than just regular life. And I was in a, a theater company, very professional. We didn't get paid. It was a community theater, but we did a full five show season every year. Mm -hmm. And I was working with them full time. And I was like one of the only young people involved. So it wasn't like a children's deal. Like everybody in the theater company was in their thirties or twenties or even their forties. And then there was a, one or two of us who were in our teens. So this community of being part of them and yet also a teenager was another version of this sort of yes and but i'm this but i'm not that or i'm kind of like this but i'm still also that which you're not and i wasn't performing on stage as much because i had braces so it was very difficult to cast me because often the shows that the theater company did they did not take place in contemporary society they were like fabulous fantastical tales and fairy tales and things like that so the braces thing was really a strike against me but the theater director recognized my skill at being a more generative artist. And so he made me the prop master and I designed and created all kinds of fantastic props, which used my skill set as an artist that I had as drawing and writing my comics. And now I was making three dimensional things. So it was evolving, but it was like, I was in the theater, but I felt myself to be this performer, but I wasn't on stage. And so finally I, I went to dance and I started dancing at 17 as I mentioned. And in the world of the, the conservatory, there was the ballet class that you took every day, but then there was the modern class in the afternoon. And these two techniques were diametrically opposed. Everything about them was so different. In the ballet class, you had to stand up for the whole time. You had to have your eyes open for the whole time. You had to look at the teacher and mimic, absolutely ape what they did with their body. Right. In the modern class, we lay on the floor, we closed our eyes, and we moved from our own impulses. We didn't look at anybody. So these were really, really different paradigms of dance training. And I really fell in love with both. And so there was this, I'm this, but I'm also that. I'm the ballet dancer guy, but I'm also this weird modern improviser guy. And then it was like, I was in the world of the dance and everybody was a dancer, but I'm also a theater guy. And then in the world of the theater, I was like, but I'm also a drawer and a writer. So there was always this kind of both and dimension about what was happening, kind of in a way that, that I can look back and say that I was female identified in some ways, but I was also male identified in some ways. So there was this kind of both and thing happening. And then I went into a dance career and I, as I mentioned in my introduction, and I had a, a Vegas chapter, which was very show busy, super show busy, didn't have any of the modern dance, contemporary dance piece. And it wasn't inquiring into society. And I thought, I love to dance. I'm thrilled to go out on stage every night and be paid to dance. But I'm also this guy who wants to inquire into society and reflect on why do we do these things? and What is happening in the world? And that's the spirit that's behind a lot of what was happening in modern dance. So I went to New York. While, I was in, while I'm in New York, I'm desperate to like really build up my career and, and be, you know, really achieve myself as a successful dancer. And yet I want to do that in both the downtown scene and I take modern classes and I audition for modern dance companies, but also the uptown scene. And I take jazz classes and ballet classes and voice classes and I audition for Broadway shows. So there's this uptown downtown Paul. And so this then gets ex exacerbated or explored or expounded or expanded when I'm in uh, Denver, which is where I went when I first came back to the States from Paris. Here I am, this guy who's kind of French. I lived in France for five years, but I'm really American. Uh, and I'm, I'm a dancer, but I'm sick with AIDS. And there was all these aspects of the both and experience that were not feeling very both and. They felt like neither nor. Mm. It's like, like, well, you're not really a, a Parisian. Well, you're not really uh, an American who's lived in the States all his life. But if you are an American, you're not like a guy who works in business for a bank or an insurance, no, you were this weird dancer guy. Then I wound up getting involved in academia and it's like, oh, I did well in academia. I got into it, but I had all this movement-based stuff and I was so wanting to bring 
somatics and the, the real room alive and not just talk about ideas and concepts. And so again, the sense of, yes, this, but that. And in my brain, I think for many, many, many years, the whole thing kind of felt like a, a but. Yes, but. Yes, I'm a, a PhD, but I'm this performer guy. I, I do show business and, and, and modern dance. Yes, I'm a man, but I'm identifying and seeing the world and, and, and resonating so much with the, the storyline or the ways that society has, has shaped things about the feminine. Yes, I'm healthy. You know, as my life progressed and the drugs did their job, there I was continuing and working at Stanford and working at UC Berkeley and doing independent gigs with Kay and traveling and doing things with her in Korea and Ireland. And, and yet I was still sick. I mean, my HIV hasn't gone away. And even though I'm healthy enough to not be afraid of dying in the next six weeks, I have a lot of residual issues that have kept me on disability because of my digestive tract or because of my joint issues or because of some of the ways that my emotional health has been rocked in various ways. So what's been coming clear to me, and I want to thank you for, because of your asking me to be on this show, it kind of gave me the opportunity, a context to think about this. And I was like, oh, finally at 62, I'm enough in myself with these experiences of yes, but, to where I'm able to be more finally in a kind of yes and. And that's both my journey, but it's also the world around me has journeyed. So as people like me have said, yes, but, okay, PhD world, I want us to all put our books down and stand up and go, we're going to do this movement thing. So as I took those risks to introduce things in context A that didn't look familiar to context A, I wasn't just asserting that for my sake, I was actually supporting something that was, I believe, helpful in terms of moving into a more of a both and kind of world where things are not as rigidly separated out into silos of identity and culture and subculture. So the, here's my belief. The world around me in the past 15, 20 years has grown to be a more both and world. When Kay and I first met back in 2005, doing things like improv and movement and yoga and choreography with people in, on a, in a business gig, like your consultants for an organization, that was just like really, really radically bizarre. And most people would just say, oh, that sounds interesting, but, that, but it's not for us. These days, it's not considered radical. It's mainstream. That, Everyone's it's doing it. It's become much more mainstream. So I see this both and thing as something that I have been wrestling with personally, but also doing things about. I've been making statements in the world. I've been risking being seen and trying to influence a certain group at a given time and a given workshop. And that has been influential. I'm not going to take credit for the whole world changing, but I think there's a lot of people in, in somewhat similar stories to me who have said, it's important for me to be seen about this as well. Even though in this context, yes, I'm A, I might even be, and you all applaud that, but I want you to know that I'm also C. Even if that doesn't seem to fit here, it's important to me. So that's where I'm recognizing the both and as something that has come with age and my own acceptance. And I don't have to wrestle with my own sense of which is who, who, which community do I belong to as freaked out about the right tribe. It's like, I'm me. Well, this is very interesting about you transferring from both but to both and. Are there any particular instances that happened in your life that pushed you to consider moving from both but to both and? Why did you feel the need to move on to both and? I think the need has probably evolved. I think developmentally, when I was in my teens, the need might have been, I wanna be special. I wanna be seen as special. So even though everybody in this space can do regular theater, I can also draw and make these incredible things. When I was in my 20s, I think it might've been more about marketing purposes because I was really concerned about making a living as we all are in a capitalist world. So I think the being seen as a bit of a both and during those years developmentally, I was trying to position myself in the market. If you're looking for someone who's six feet tall and he's roughly 25 and he's white, you can get me. 
because I can also speak French. It was like an added plus. And then in my 40s, I think it was about these larger questions of society. Here I was involved in really critiquing large scale processes of, of human history and how we do society. So I think in those spaces, it became aligned with, aligned with a larger value of equity and justice, that there's a kind of injustice done to all of us when we are reduced, when we're, when we're seen as a, a bit of a, a two-dimensional person, because it just it's easier for people to look at each other and go, oh, she's Asian and she's female, so boom, suddenly I have this story about who I think you are. That's not fair to you. There's a, there's a lack of, of willingness to be with the complexity of people. And it's not our fault. The brain has evolved to, to make shortcuts because it's, the brain wants to be efficient. But we live in such a complex world that it's not enough to just say, oh, well, our brain does that. I think we have to step up and create new ways that our brain can create new kinds of neural pathways to support how we see each other more fully because we have so much power. The human race has created itself into this god-awful force of power. I mean, we are destroying the planet, not to mention each other in these really intricate and sophisticated ways. So I think there's a bigger challenge as my needs have changed and grown. Now I think that I feel part of a, of a global community that wants to heal and save aspects of life on this planet, which includes the ozone layer and the coral reefs, but it also includes homo sapiens because we have done such things to each other that we are often run by these kinds of silos and these marketing needs. I will share one anecdote that speaks to your question. I don't know if it pushed me to be in the both and space, but it, it revealed something that helped me be in the both and space. So here I am, after a couple of years of facilitating at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, and it's 2008 or 2009, maybe. I started in 2006, so I'm a, a couple years into it. And at that point, everybody, that it seemed that I was working with these students, they were off to go become, what is that job description? The consultants of some kind where they manage money and they do things with money. It's like, I get an MBA at Stanford so that I can go make money, right? And it seemed like there was a lot of pressure that they put on each other mm -hmm. to be really successful. And then here I am coming in as a facilitator with the supposed added status of like, I'm teaching, I'm helping, I have something to give you. So the fact that I was on disability, that I was getting a, a handout from the government, which thank God covered my health insurance because I would not be alive today if it wasn't for those drugs that I have to take. And believe you me, I cannot afford them if I didn't have Medicaid and Medicare. So what happened, Hamida, was that there I was in my story of these people will reject me if I let them know that I'm not super professional and super successful and working with really important people who are making lots and lots of money. Mm -hmm. Like that was what I thought I had to do. So in a way I was reinforcing this yes, but. I was reinforcing in my mind, I'm this, but I'm also that. And it was a divide, there was a divide between the A and the B in my personal experience because I believed that I couldn't really reveal both sides of myself in that context. So what happened was that there got to be times when I took the risk to share more because in this course, which lasts 10 weeks and you're in a group of 12 students, two facilitators for at a minimum of three hours a week for 10 weeks, so you're with each other a lot. And the invitation mm. to take some risks interpersonally is really present for all of us, including the facilitators. So as I would dip my toe into the waters of saying, well, I don't have a big, fabulous, fancy career. I don't work for multinational companies and make you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They didn't reject me. So there was this place where something about not trusting the story of who I thought they were, but instead trusting my wanting to be seen. I trusted taking the risk to see what the reaction was rather than prevent myself from, from disclosing because I believed my story of what I thought they valued. And it's true also, I do wanna say, that the student body at the Graduate School of Business has changed. I believe that there are, is a smaller percentage of the people who enroll there who are hell bent on making money. There's more students who say, when I graduate, I'm going back to Poland to work with single moms 
et cetera. There's people who have really interesting stories and, and values and visions for what they want to do with their MBA that are not about going to McKinsey. So they became a little bit more receptive as time moved on and other people in their worlds made it more okay to say, you don't have to reject people because they don't want to make money. And I also got more willing to take the risk because I think part of it was that I was willing to maybe be rejected at this stage of my life. I don't think I could have done that back in the day when I was dancing in Paris or whatever. So basically more of a community story where they were open to accepting you for who you were and you were ready to be vulnerable before them and shed the stories that you made up about them. I do want to ask you about your dancing career. I know you went to many places, Seattle and Vegas and New York and Paris, or all the places that any professional dancer would die to go and perform. Do you have any anecdotes from there? Any lessons you've learned from your wonderful all of the world dancing trips? What's coming to me yeah, as I listen to you and I think about my dancing career and I think about dance as a, you know, as a, a deep practice, like you really, if you're going to go for it as a profession, you have to really connect. And it, the thing is that it's, I, it's ironically super social. It's like you working with you, you are working with you to really refine and develop like an athlete, right? Like a diver. Think of somebody who's a professional diver. You are refining exactly how your ankle of your right leg meets the ankle of your left leg, just as you're contracting just a little bit in your lower abdomen and you're lifting your chin as you lean into the twirl and the spin as you're on your, like those rehearsals of your musculature and your bones are what dancers do. But you dancers take class with 20, 30 other people in the room. So day in and day out, you're with all these people. And of course the act of performing whether or not you're doing some concert where you're you know, 10 dancers on stage or 50 dancers on stage, or maybe you're doing a solo concert and you're the only dancer on stage. It's always a group phenomenon because the audience is there. So there's this thing about the both and of being working hard and training and deeply attending to and committing to your own self in such a direct way. I mean, like my body, I'm like actually my muscles. And yet it's so social and it's so communal and it's such a shared event. So I think that's one thing that is, is remarkable about it that I am grateful for in a way that it helps strengthen for me the width of that spectrum. On the one, on the far right, for example, you could say it's self and on the far left of this spectrum, you could say us. It's an I and over here it's a we. And I'm grateful in all of those spaces that I danced in, all of those years of my dancing career, as much as the we changed, like the we in the Las Vegas world was very different than the we in the downtown performance art space in the East Village in the 80s in New York. Right, <laughs> they were right, like right. not at all valuing the same kinds of things. I can imagine that. Content and artistic choices. But what was true underneath all of those experiences was this uh, figurating, me, us, me, us. And each kept reinforcing and contributing to the other. And I'm grateful for that because I believe that's what happens for all of us because the human animal is a social animal. But we live, many of us, in communities and follow practices where this figurating is not as present and it's not worked as creatively as I think it does to happens in the dance world. Yeah, I, I agree. We do need to become a more interlinked community as the universe had designed us to be. We've just kind of moved away from that. And I'm hoping post COVID that changes and everyone realizes that since we have been in isolation for so many months, there will be a community need to come together and get interlinked again. Thumbs up to that, thumbs up to that. And with that, it was wonderful talking to you, Paul. I do appreciate it. Hoping to stay in touch and Absolutely. thank you for all of those wonderful anecdotes and stories. Thank you for inviting me. You are a very bright light in my world and I'm grateful to just to get to chat with you and I'm, I'm hopeful that you will continue to develop this uh, wonderful podcast. Amen to that. Listeners, here are a couple of things that I am taking away from this conversation with Paul. First of all, he said, 
if you sense a dichotomy in your being and it is making you uncomfortable, then you can definitely change it from both but to both and. There is also another thing that he said towards the very end that is a really nice heartwarming message. And I am paraphrasing Paul. He said, but what was true underneath all of the experiences was this figurating me, us, me, us. And each kept reinforcing and contributing to the other. And this reminds me of a one word phrase that the tribal folks in Africa believe in. They believe in the word Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. I will leave you with this final beautiful message. And this brings us to the end of this episode. I am so excited to bring you the 25th episode of Sharing Life Lessons next Wednesday. Until then, be happy, be safe, and be well.